I, my name is Matthew Collins. I work for Hope Not Hate, the uh, anti-racist and anti-fascist organization. Um, despite my advancing years, I was once young. Uh, I, in the 1980s, I was a member of the National Front and uh, a host of other far-right organizations. And now I run spies, moles, walk-ins in the far-right in the United Kingdom. Okay. What would you say it was that actually led to you getting involved in the far right movements? I mean, obviously nothing like this is binary. Everything is incredibly nuanced. But were there were there any particular reasons that you found yourself getting attracted to that and wanting to be a part of it? The, uh, the what is the attraction to the far right? I I, I guess um, I guess it, it's it's one of a number of potential or possible answers to a number of questions young people have in their life and for me the the idea that my life would be infinitely better by making more miserable the uh, lives of others um, was the attraction I, I'm working class I was brought up on a council estate I lived in South East London it was, it was four brothers there was no father at home obviously we experienced um poverty and I'm not one of those that's going to say I, I was trapped in the far right because that would be that would be very dishonest I was attracted to the far right for me they they you know I say this all the time now but they answered what are complex questions very very simply and I I, I found as a member of the far right something I hadn't realized I'd been looking for but yeah, it, it, look, for 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 a while it was great. It was the best time of my life. It was brilliant. Mm. I belong. I belonged to something, and I think that's I think that's really important. And we see that in a lot of other people. Absolutely. And when you say the kind of easy answers to complex questions, is it the thing that would? Is it the sort of answers that would spring to mind as, <clears throat> such as, you know, why can't I get a job because of that person with a different skin color down the street? Why can't I? You know, why am why are me and my friends and my family not living as well as some other people because of because of yeah, yeah, you, it... yeah you've you've hit you've you've hit the you've hit the nail on the head um and those questions are very very simple questions but actually they are complex often they take a long time to it to explain and, it, and some of us find ourselves in the i think often unenviable unenviable position where we have to take time to I understand that these are also actually quite sensitive questions. When you're dealing about uh, when you're dealing about poverty, so on, so so forth, people's personal poverty, their their difficulties in life, they are they are complex questions. It is very very complex, particularly particularly with young young brains, as mine was very very young, underutilized and underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. But for me, but for me, I. You know, growing up in South London, you almost grew up in the shadow of the National Front because mm. NF was on just about every bloody wall and bridge and, 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 and shop window. And in fact, by the time I joined the National Front in uh, the mid-1980s, they hardly existed as an organisation. They were down to uh, just a few hundred a few hundred members. But the sort of shadow it cast, I think, over lives, uh, mine and others, was it was enormous it, you know its reach was it was enormous it, it's its reach was actually over exaggerated to be honest with you really? but for me I, I for me i found a place in there and that was it one thing that i yeah. found really interesting in an interview you did in the past was mentioning that there was um a kind of appeal to a need or want for a positive male role model or any kind of real male role model as you said because you know obviously your dad wasn't around and stuff do you think yes. do you think i mean nothing again it's very nuanced and stuff but if you could if you have a, a thought on it do you think that there's a reason why men tend to be young men tend to be the ones targeted and attracted into these movements rather than young women well the young there was a period not necessarily of young women either but when the english defense league grew um we'd never seen so many women involved in the far right it was it was extraordinary partly i think that was down to the social media th aspect and also some of the uh issues that perhaps the edl tried to uh take advantage of that were pertinent i think to to women particularly to uh 
particularly to, to young women. Going back about the male role model thing, um, you're yeah, quite right. I had exemplary um, female role models, uh, not just my mother, but uh, grandmother and and aunties around her as well, who done, who were that sort of war generation. My mum was a war baby, and so the people who I grew up around my mum, her her mother and her aunties, were were women who'd lived through the Blitz, and my grandma mother worked on the searchlights you know shine up at crystal palace shining um the, the really strong, powerful lights on on uh, german bombers but it, i i think probably the one thing i would say looking back at that period is particularly young boys weren't taught the the value of female role models um in, in not just our, our mothers but but women in general women in society i mean the most powerful woman um, I had grown up was Margaret Thatcher, and of course we were all taught to hate her. But in terms of the role that women played in in our society, we knew very little of it, and weren't encouraged to sort of respect it or admire it or look into it, let alone understand it. And that sort of men of my generation, in fact myself too, have been guilty of the most horrendous um, misogyny. Um, and so because of that, because there was like this absent lead role model in the house, I guess, yeah, I guess the natural front was appealing because it had lots of sort of father figures. And one thing I learned in the national front, and one thing I, I, I learned growing up is that, of course, some male role models or, or some male lead figures are probably best left out of lives. And some people, and I put, I put, I, I put in my new book, actually, after studying the sort of men where I lived and where I grew up, particularly when you, you witness, I, I guess we witnessed quite a bit of domestic violence on the estate, very, very quickly came to embrace the idea that we were brought up by our mother. But, you know, again, searching for positive or, or otherwise real, uh, male role models is generally because we weren't taught to understand and respect and appreciate the what women, what women did, yeah. um, bringing up young boys, I guess. Yeah, and it because you let if you look at let's say you know the there there's obviously massive links between let's say the um, incel uh, movements online and and the far right and so much of the incel movements and let's say people like Andrew Tate so yeah. much of what they're doing is like teaching you how to be a man and yeah yeah exactly what what, a, sort, what sort of man yeah exactly what yeah exactly that but you know I know a lot of people and you know my siblings included where. We, we often say that, you know, our mother was the best father we ever could have had, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And do you think that it is some kind of, is it a, is it a toxic masculinity thing? Is it some weird sort of uh, collective, um, I don't know, collective sort of blind spot in a lot of men's heads that, no, 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 I, my, if to be a, a proper man, I need to have a male role model rather than, you know, as you said, you know, neighbours, mothers, aunts, grandparents. Yeah, I think the... I, I, I've always been a little bit suspicious about toxic masculinity because I, maybe it's overplayed. Yeah. There is a certain sort of male who seems to have a particular view of women. And unfortunately, and it's the sort of view of women you used to get when you're 13 and 14 reading pornography. And then now in society watching pornography, a particular mm. view of women. And the, these men, these incels, seem to be very, very disturbed and very, very distressed about the idea of independent, intelligent women. And they, you know, they're not just disturbed by it, they're, you know, they're violently disturbed by it. And of course it says more about them than it, than it does about women. And the lead on into this, and I had discussion about this last night, is that some of the people who lead the far right, some of the far right movements in this country are themselves in cells, who spend their, you know, and grown males, you know, people in their forties who are obsessed by playing online video games. And then they complain that a character, a female character in their online video games, which is all about people who fly and fire bombs out of their backsides. The females in these online video games are too powerful. And these are the, and and by the same respect, as well as living these sort of imaginary lives online, 
uh, and complaining that uh, these imaginary female characters have too many powers. These are the same people that are complaining that there's a declining white birth rate and are, and are also encouraging people to go out and try and create babies, none of which they can do at home hate, by hating women and playing computer games. So the, the potential is, of course, that at least these people won't be breeding in the near future. I think a lot of, I, it's, it's unquestionable, is that the, the attitudes towards women in society, particularly as we see more and more women in, in positions of authority or in positions of power or where women are making um, decisions, um, there will always be people who reject that. Look, we've had we've had three female prime ministers in the United Kingdom. I've not liked any one of them, um, but it's never been about it's never been about their their gender. But, but th there is a particularly and it's nasty and it's increasing. And I think it's just one of I think it's one of the things that fills a different vacuum. We see different vacuums popping up. Is that increasingly we use the hatred of we've now injected a hatred of women. Look. I, I grew up in the far right. There was no one living a very sort of um, sexy lifestyle. And there wasn't many of these men who walked around all day in duffel coats and hush puppers who were uh, having relationships. Incels are basically um, angry little boys and angry young men who can't get laid. That's mm -hmm. simply what it is. And the, you know, in, in that respect, they are the victims of, of their own hatred. And instead of redressing it, Somehow, I mean, I don't really know how they could. I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's plenty of female commentators and academics who could tell you what they could do. But instead of addressing it and understanding it, um, they just become more and more embittered, more and more nasty and more and more violent. And we saw, and I saw to the point where it made me feel quite unwell um, at the tail end of national action and some of the organizations that came after it post 2017 quite, you know, sort of lower middle class, reasonably well educated, like university educated young men who had such a disturbing hatred of women. And we know that the far right, incre you know, have always, of course, encouraged violence against people of color or people of different religions that they don't like. And then they added to this sort of dire portfolio of hatred going from a, a far right which I knew which was about always loving and honoring women as long as they stay at home and only wear skirts and stuff like that to an absolute hatred a violent hatred of women and some of the documents I read some of the blog posts I read were encouraging far right activists to attack women were encouraging and them to use sexual violence as a political weapon was was encouraging rape was encouraging child sexual abuse was encouraging child sexual exploitation and all of all, all of these things have become the new ideology and all of these things are really really prevalent of course on the internet in these secret uh, chat rooms and all of these things of course we could try much harder to stamp on mm. my parents having a little bit more responsibility about what young men are listening to and what young men are watching and it's probably it, and it's problematic because we put we do put a lot of um pressure on parents and you and i were talking about of course and it sounds like you've got about as many siblings as i do which, which, which is many is yeah. often asking you know like single mums or single dads um, who've got a lot on their plate just trying to understand and navigate through the difficulties we face in, in our current um, economic and, and social crisis to then start having to worry further about the dangers of what young people are exposed to online. And yes, definitely uh, parents have a responsibility for that, but we could all do with a, we could all do with a little bit more help and I should I should plug in I should plug while doing this that my organization hope not hate um, does a series of seminars and classes for parents and teachers on this and we've got guides and all that and it's actually as a parent myself it's um, you know who's supposed to know all and everything um, some of the material that our education department produces is startling 
But again, by the same respect, would encourage people not to shy away or, or cower from this. I think if you, we, all of us who aren't stuck in dark bedrooms, uh, listening to nonsense on the internet, we have a responsibility. I think it's a wider responsibility as well that we that we that, that, that we tackle this. I said this the other day. Don't worry about hate on the internet. Is that the internet's vast and wide? There's plenty of plenty of space left for us to um, to fill it with either positive or educational or worthwhile things. But it is right. It, it very very much the the young the life and world of young men at the moment. I think is rather turbulent and traumatic. And a lot of young men seem to be struggling to to cope with it. No excuse for, of course, where some of them find themselves. But the 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 idea that um, women are being constantly targeted is not a new one. It's just another one that's not addressed. Again, still not addressed. So, you know, I'm conscious of that. Like I said earlier on, I'm I, you know I'm getting older every day, and I'm I'm learning, I'm learning new things every day. I I generally don't. I, I think it's a, I think it's a really, really difficult mm-hmm. one to 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 challenge uh it, it means involuntarily celibate um you know i, I don't think misogyny is ever going to get anyone laid you no, know absolutely not yeah, yeah i mean that's the, that's the truth but, but um yeah so in cells is is the is, is the um is the latest thing and of course the, the more into it and further into it you go you you, you end up you end up, of course, with child sexual exploitation. You end up with Satanists, and in mm-hmm. there as well, you end up with Nazis. Mm-hmm. On your own realization, let's say that that you didn't want to be a part of the the far right movement yeah. anymore. Um, obviously, the you know, in your in kind of when you've spoken in the past and stuff, the the Battle of Welling is that I believe what it was yeah. called, what it's yeah. became known as. Um, an attack in a library that you you said you were you were shocked by the fact that it was basically old age pensioners and mostly and lots of women yeah. some some pregnant um before you kind of get into that where did you have doubts before that um or was that was that just like no, was it a one off event that made you realize wow no i never no i never i never had doubts about i never had doubts about anything i plugged my new book of course the walk in which i'll show you a copy of Absolutely. but it, it, in you know, I sort of had a moment of clarity when I was writing it, and it was like, no matter what issue there was that faced us, white working class men all, all clubbed in and all, all uh, stuffed in rooms together, no matter what the issue was, housing, unemployment, hospitals, every discussion we had on it ended with someone needs to get their face smashed in with a hammer. And so I knew that the the response generally was, and still is, where possible, meet any challenge with violence, indiscriminate violence. And I was I was okay with that. You know, I was no angel. But when I and I, I'd also taken part in in in, in violence. That's no mm. secret either. But when you're gripped by um, what would have, what would have been an opportunity? Don't forget, fascists are always talking about their freedom of speech and their rights to freedom of speech the welling library was a a a public meeting held by concerned citizens and i said this before the sort of concerned citizens that would also try and stop a library from closing or a a local school from closing or a hospital from closing those sort of people good people and they were concerned about a far-right bookshop now the opportunity the option for people that believed in freedom of speech would have been to go there and argue that case. But instead, they took the opportunity to attack everybody in that meeting. I mean, we're not talking about pushing and shoving, we're talking about extreme violence. Now, in the middle, in the midst of all that, um, I looked around at the sort of people who were lying blooded and bruised and terrified and I thought everything I ever wanted to achieve or needed to achieve or that was ever going to be better for me my family my friends is laying on the floor here battered bruised and blooded because these morons I'm with my love of my lovable Nazi moron friends 
I've never tried to stop a school from closing. I've never, in fact, tried to close schools. I've never uh, tried to keep a library open. In fact, they like to burn books. They've never tried to keep a hospital open, despite the fact they put plenty of people in them. And I just looked around and I just thought, this is not going to change anything. And I realized the actually the attraction for me was just wanting to lift myself out of the sort of poverty, the boredom, and the life I was in, and the National Front, the NP, and the far right had to a certain extent lifted boredom. Mm-hmm. But actually it had no interest in, in changing um, my social or economic conditions. It was just solely about uh, battering and, and bruising people. And I'd had prior to that, no objections, of course, yeah. to battering and bruising people. I always tell the truth about that. And so it was that that moment and after that moment, with the first time in for the first time in my life I'd ever really began to think uh, properly about the things that I felt or the emotions that I had and the angers that I had. And then much later you go and see a shrink and they say, You should have come here 30 years ago. But um you uh I, I just thought about them i just thought and i just said oh it's absolutely this is absolutely bizarre i just no longer believe in this i just and i didn't know what i did believe and i hmm. also i put my hands up i you know I, I may have become an anti-fascist probably on the spot or thereafter but i did i wouldn't say i became anti-racist or, or confident about addressing prejudices or things that confronted me for, for much, much longer. You see, you have to be an anti-fascist and an anti-racist. Some people, some people think they're both, and some people are both. But, you you know, sometimes one outweighs the other, so you've got to go in uh, double-fisted on this thing. But it took me it took me a while, because I still held prejudices. Uh, but I just, you know, interestingly, I just thought, it, well, nothing's going to be addressed or by going around kicking little old ladies in the face. Yeah, I suppose it's you, well, that... you might want to edit that because that might sound no, horrendous. No, no, no. I think uh, personally, I think with something like this, it's look, there's no do you, is there any point in sugarcoating what the oh, reality god, no, is listen, the far right? Listen, do you know what I mean? No, listen, I mean, I know, I know, no, I'm not look, come here. I'm not gonna try listen, to teach my once granny you've said fuck eggs. on the BBC, well, yeah, once you've said fuck on the BBC, you've done all there is to do. That's it, exactly. Yeah, it's all, <laughs> it's, all, it's all gravy from there, but um, the yeah, the, that kind of point of view of like you know. <clears throat> I find it really interesting one and a very honest one that you know your decision to kind of become anti-fascist on the spot was more to do with how you realized you didn't want to be a part of the world that you're in anymore rather than uh, in the environment uh, yeah And, and also and also driven by i didn't want to be a part of this world anymore but i didn't really have anything or anywhere else to go and i wasn't gonna just walk away and leave this Hmm. um and you know there there is a cure the cure for fascism is anti-fascism yeah (laughs) couldn't agree more when you did you know make that decision to let's say to speak to searchlight and and do those things was it um was it a were you let's say despite knowing that it wasn't a, a scene you wanted to be a part of anymore and I, this is purely, this is like a genuine question here rather than an assumption or anything. Because like the way I was thinking about it was, let's say, despite the violence and the clear hatred involved in that in that movement, would it be fair to say that you did actually build up lots of strong, real relationships? And, and was oh, there- Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You need to read my new book. No, ab- will absolutely. Read new book. <laughs> you will read my new book. No, absolutely. Because um, you, you, you know, whether you want to or not, you'll never, you'll never meet friends like that mm. ever. Now, you're talking about people who would probably kill for you. Mm. You're talking about people who had no qualms about about violence. There's a lot of people who think they've seen violence in their in their lives, um, and they probably have. But violence like these people are capable of dishing out indiscriminately. And if you've got friends like that. You do think they're probably better, they're better friends than they are enemies. Now, of course, they're enemies now. I can't do anything about that. Mm. Um, but they were all, and, and they were also friends. They were my only friends. And then problematically, uh, you, you, you think your friends are all a bit dangerous and all a bit mad. And 
eventually you sort of think, you, you realise actually you're not that different to them either. So I did, uh, I did suffer a, a period of, I, I, I guess, um, not, I, I went to live in Australia and some of them I did miss. And I, you know, 1993, I went to live in Australia and I had 10 years there. And I think the internet was discovered sometime while I was there, but it didn't filter down to me until much later. So there was no way of keeping touch, you know, keeping an eye on what they were doing or seeing what they're doing. But of course, those people were, as well, of course, as it eventually became apparent, those people were part of what became the modernization of the BNP. So from stamping on little old ladies' heads in libraries to suddenly wearing suits and going to the electorate, that these were the people. So I saw them then. Mm. And, I, and I, I thought, you know, yeah, the, the dangers of these people has gone from stamping on heads in libraries to handing out leaflets on, on council estates. But yes, I, I, had, I had missed them. And in this new life that I've had now, uh, uh, three people, I four people, oh God, yeah, four, four people I was sort of, I worked closely with uh, during the period I was betraying them have since come to see me, come to meet me and have, have cups of tea and, and or pass information on their colleagues so I, the older I get the more I think there's fewer and fewer of them without uh, redemption or without the uh, without something in them that realizes that, that there's nothing good in it um, and I yeah I mean I don't now but I did miss them I did pine for them I did you know particularly when I was living in Australia and I didn't have the sort of friends that would go around and beat people up for me you know they <laughs> I had to do it all myself, it was horrendous. But no, of course. <laughs> Look, they, they were genuine friendships. And I would never yeah. say that they weren't. They, you know, even when I was completely fucking them over, mm -hmm. they were still my friends. Yeah. Oh, I guess what that's a terrible, the what a terrible thing to admit. But I guess that's the kind of, you know, when we say we would die for our friends, most of us don't yes. mean it literally. Do you know what I mean? No, <laughs> I, I know, but then but I mean, then very few people who have got friends that would kill you as well. So, you know, yeah, I, that's I, true. I, I, yeah, yeah, but you, you have to balance that up. Jumping forward to 2017, you were contacted by a member of a far right organization, um, a man named Robbie Mullen, about a plot to kill a Labour MP. Can you explain how that came about, how the, the contact with you and with Hope Not Hate came about? Working at Hope Not Hate, my job was to my job is to sort of write exposés, undermine and get people inside the far right to either work for us or pass us information. Mm. Uh, some do, some will just, so, listen, some will just sell us a sexy bit of information for 50 yeah. quid and it's like, bang, there you go. And others will come to us the same way I had 30 years before in horror and outrage, desperation and, and a deep sadness about the situation they were in or they'd found or they'd found themselves in and one such person in 2017 was Robbie Mullen who uh, was a member of the banned organization National Action which was banned in December 2016. He came to us in 2017 and said I'm still a member of this group and I can't get out and I was absolutely delighted. If you're watching the walk-in on ITV, you'll see I was absolutely delighted. And I, Robbie and I sort of cultivated a relationship, you know, we, we met each other, we discussed um, the group, the organisation. It was a terrorist organisation. You know, people find it hard to believe. It was a terrorist organisation with, with a warehouse and a gym and an office in Warrington in Northwest England. And Robbie was part of it. He was quite senior of it. He wanted out. He couldn't get out. He didn't think he could get out. And I understood that because um, one of the things about being in the far right is it tends to lose you friends in the real world. Yeah. And it tends to, even if even if you thought you were isolated to start with, wait until you join the far right. And I understood that he had uh, feelings of isolation and the idea of leaving made him anxious, the idea of staying in part terrified him and so we worked together the idea would be that we would do this great expose because it would have been a great expose it would have embarrassed everyone we like nothing more than embarrassing those people in power. it would have been a great embarrassment when we'd have got you know pictures and we'd have published pictures of the gym and all the new leadership and national action and all the you know the photographs of them inside training and all this but unfortunately 
before we could before we could do that, Jack Renshaw um, met National Action one night and told him he wanted to murder his local MP, and he wanted to murder a policewoman. And fortunately for the MP and the policewoman, our man Robbie Mullen was in that meeting, and he saved their lives. Jack Renshaw, the person who went to the meeting, had been in the BNP, he'd been in the EDL for a bit. A tiny little boy who went to Manchester University, incredibly bright, incredibly bright and well-spoken. It was almost admirable, you know, that they could still attract people, you know, who could, you know, basically speak properly. Mm. And this boy, Jack Renshaw, he got himself into a terrible mess. He'd, he'd been trying to encourage young boys on the internet to meet him for sex. He'd been caught doing that. And his way out of it, the way that he, he felt he could placate his comrades was going to them saying that he would kill his local MP and the policewoman investigating him for child sexual offences. So it's also quite a little bit sad, I guess. But yeah, guess. The, 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 the good part of the story is that we had Robbie Mullen in the meeting and he was able to, to set the alarm and then save Rosie Cooper, Rosie Cooper MP's life. When you when you were told about the plot, um, was it a how how was the reaction? Was it a mix of like obviously disgust and her you know this is horrific what's happening, but then also you know confidence that that all right this is also an opportunity to really really fucking hurt these people. No, didn't think that. Uh, the first thing was fucking hell, right? So. Took us ages to work out who the MP was because he kept mm. saying Rosie Cooper, and I'd never mm. heard of Rosie Cooper, but I'd heard of Vivek Cooper, and she'd also been targeted by National Action. Yeah. But we had that conversation, and then of course I remembered the power of Google, and I said, "Oh yes, she, Rosie Cooper is an MP, and yes, she's Jack Renshaw's local MP." Mm. The most important thing, most important thing, obvious most important thing, never been put in this situation before. Yeah. And you never want to be was make that MP safe, make that policewoman safe. And the yeah. second concern was that this thing that we had going on, this, this idea that Robbie could have worked for us for a short time, you know, we'd have done the big expose exclusive as like we do with groups sometime and then slowly withdraw our person. That was never gonna happen. And I remember mm -hmm. one of the very first things I said to Robbie was, this is all over now. And what we have to do now is get you an immunity from prosecution, never mind you disappearing. Mm -hmm. And he took it reasonably well. But the main thing, though, no, the main thing was, fuck, you know, make sure the MP is safe. Of course. Make sure the policewoman is safe. And then deal with all the deal with all the other things because his his life was ruined. He was quite, you know, he was a, he was a young man, mm -hmm. right? He could have gone home from the pub, gone to bed. And woken up on the Tuesday morning to the news that you know an MP had been murdered by a bloke he knows. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nobody knew really who Robbie Mullen was. Nobody really knew who Matthew Hankinson was. Nobody knew who Christopher Lifko was, or many of the other people that were in the meeting uh, the night it was discussed. So, you know, they probably could have slipped away into anonymity if, if Renshaw had been more clever, but. Mm -hmm. Our, our thing was that Robbie's life was ruined now. And that, yeah. you know, that, that breaks my heart a little bit. But yeah, what can you do? I wanted to ask you about, just about kind of uh, far-right extremism in the UK, um, yeah. uh, just in itself. Do you believe, and I think I have a feeling how you're going to respond, do you believe that British authorities and law enforcement take it as seriously as they should, particularly when it's, Let's say this might be a bit. A bit let's just a let's just say let's just let's just say to to they're getting a lot better. Okay, they are getting a lot better. It, it, it's it's passed from the greatest respect to the counter police. They don't have time or the resources to try and get a forensic understanding. Mm. And the monitoring of the far right terror threat moved to the security services, and they do sit at home and can sit at home all day reading everything. The police often treat the far right as like a law and order issue, as often the far right is. But in terms of terrorism, it needed something more forensic and then it's moved to the security services and it's getting better. Well, what, well, what, they, what they've done is they've, they've understood that they're no longer dealing with, um, you know, a gang of drunks like the EDL. No longer are they dealing with the 
sort of movement like the BNP was 12 years ago. They're dealing with something far different, dare I say, even more, more sinister. Um, and that needed a, a forensic examination. So the so it, it's moved to the security services since 2018. Monitoring the extreme far right has moved to the security services. And whereas the police would treat the extreme far right as a public order issue, so instance, wherever they go, windows are broken and things are damaged, they realize that it needed to be forensically looked at. And so that has moved to the security services. And as of yet, we've had no, uh, what you would call a, a spectacular terror attack by the extreme far right. Don't, don't doubt for one moment there aren't people out there in the far right who would love um, a, a terrorist spectacular. But so far, the security services in this country have, have been very, very, um, almost almost confrontational they've gone for these people yeah. when they've had particular documents and when they've expressed uh, particular desires i got no i got no issue with that at all by the way i'm sure yeah. some some bleeding heart liberal will say it's their it's their right and duty to download bomb making manuals um and so i think i so i think that's good in terms of a, in yeah. terms of living in a civilized society that we, we are protected people people are protected from those and so you know it's not the job of um, hope, not hate to stop murderers. That was uh, that was coincidental. So mm. I'm, I'm I'm happy with that, and we can get back to doing what we do, which is pretty much a pretty much a a, a job disturbing and disrupting the extreme far right in this country. We don't we don't brag about everything we we do, obviously, because obviously we have to keep um, some people's identities secret uh, where we get our information. From. From, but I'm fairly certain your your average far right um, idiot knows that when things have gone wrong, it's not just their own idiot that contributed to it. It's us somewhere poking and prodding, and we're very we're very happy that that's that that's knowledge enough of that. Yeah, when you when you say that the the far right today is more sinister than in the past, is that because they're kind of coming through the front door in a suit and with a smile rather than bashing in the back door you know uh, with well, the I'm sure, I'm sure some of them would like to but no the no look the far right comes in 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 all guises and what they wear isn't really important i think that's oh sorry that was more uh that was more yeah uh, yeah yeah dress art um doesn't matter what what they're wearing it it's what underpins what they say is what underpins that their, their their motives um when the when the far right felt that they had electoral opportunities or when the far right felt they had the opportunity for electoral games, they were still very, very dangerous. The, I, I say this all the time, the danger of the far right isn't necessarily how big it is or how popular it is. It holds an ideology, it holds values which are destructive, which are violent. We spoke about that earlier. It's their values, it's their politics, it's their ideology. It's not about how big they are. Mm. Certainly when they, I mean, look, our, our belief is here, is here at Hope Not Hate. If they want to stand in elections, we welcome them. And we're a registered third party. So we will go and, and we do, and we have done traditionally, we have done, that's how we started. Was We would go to the electorate and we would, we would tell the electorate what the far right really believed or who these candidates really were. And you know, we gave the the balanced opinion, and gave the honest, and we gave the honest and, and, and truthful uh, facts to the electorate. When the far right don't want to do that, and at the moment they don't, and they haven't for a long time, and I don't think they will for the foreseeable future, is that the only avenues available to them are the avenues which they prefer, which are the avenues of violence, are the avenues of intimidation, are the avenues of excessive criminality, and when they're doing that will be there to undermine them too. It, 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 it's as simple as that. I yeah. don't welcome I don't welcome the you know the far right at the ballot box because that also has a detrimental effect on on community relations. But when they but when they stand for election, when they 
when they put their their face on their leaflets and they're prepared to go if they are knocking on doors and we can challenge it and we can see it i guess that's slightly more comforting that for 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 the general public than what we don't see and what they don't see about so your book and the new itv show starring stephen graham the walk in first of all how did how does it feel to have been portrayed on screen depicted by one of the greatest uh, living British actors. Oh. <clears throat> um, I didn't realise uh, just how loved Stephen Graham was, and and now I understand how loved Stephen Graham is. It feels it feels different. It um, I don't I, I I don't suppose I would have ever thought I would be uh, portrayed on on uh, television and a drama series. Um, I don't think I would have ever wished to have been. However, it's happened and I'm, I'm glad it's um, hopefully, hope not hate who I work for, get some recognition and people want to chuck them a few quid because what we do is expensive and we don't always get, we don't always get the thanks that we probably deserve. Not that we want any, we're not those sort of people. But you know, it, if it raises the profile of the organisation and then the work we do, um, then that then then that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you do you want to show? Do you want to hold us up? Hold up the book there if you've got it to hand. This is the walking. True, it's the true story behind the series. But it's not so. It's not so much uh, just about what we're seeing in in the in the five part drama because. Um, but this is just written to accompany it. Uh, I think it was catharsis for me. Mm. Um, and also just, it, it's just full of, um, just full of wry tales from other stupid things I've done. 